and begin. So I'm sure I'm to tell this to a bunch of attorneys, but behave yourselves. Don't say anything you don't want on the record. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. And get this up here for you. Perfect. <coughs> so just kind of by way of um, housekeeping, if I'm looking over here, that's where I have you guys. So if I'm looking this way, it just means I'm looking at you. Um, but can everybody see my screen okay? Perfect. I see nods and thumbs up, so we'll get started. So first of all, thank you for having us today. We're excited to have the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, and it's a relatively small group, so feel free to keep this as kind of informal as you'd like. Uh, I am not somebody at all who has any problem with being interrupted. If you've got a question, it's on your mind, just ask it. So I will keep an eye on the chat, but feel free just to unmute or and just ask your question live. Uh, obviously, this benefit is for you guys. We want to give you as much information as we can give you. And so if there's specific questions you have or things you haven't spent a few more minutes on, by all means, do not hesitate at all to ask, um, and either in the chat or just by unmuting. But we'll go ahead and get started. A little bit of introduction about who Paragus is for anybody who's not familiar with our firm. We're a 55-person employee-owned outsourced IT company. Uh, we're located in Hadley, Massachusetts, and then we also are opening up an office in Worcester, Massachusetts, and we serve medium to small organizations. I would say kind of on the really small side, maybe five employees, on the larger side, up to about 250, 300 employees, and most of those organizations are located in the Knowledge Corridor, the Western Mass region, however you want to name this area that we live and play in. And those organizations, for the most part, depend on us to be their IT department. Most of our clients do not have IT in-house. And so what they need is somebody who's going to not only be there when their computer doesn't work, when they need help, but who's also going to be helping them with things like cybersecurity, with compliance, with deciding which technology should they be using? Should they be in the cloud? Should they be local? Do they have the right backups? Really kind of being their IT partner because they typically don't have a lot of IT expertise in-house. And law firms are one of our favorite organizations to work with. We've worked with some very large ones, some small ones, kind of everything in between. Uh, and as you guys I'm sure know, technology is very important. Cybersecurity is very important. And that's what really brings us here today is to focus on that particular lens or vantage point through which we do some of the work that we do. We've been around for just about 20 years, but we've been doing what we do now for the last 11. So in 2011, the company that used to be called Valley Computer Works was renamed Paragus IT. And that's really when we became what the industry calls a managed service provider. And a managed service provider is just an outsourced IT company. One thing I always like to share with people who are getting to know us a little bit is what really fuels us, what excites us. Our passion, as we like to say it, is this idea of making IT fun. And what we mean by that is IT sometimes gets a bad rep. It's either frustrating, it's pain in the butt, it's confusing, it's intimidating. And we really want technology to be something that you, your staff, your team, not only enjoy using, but actually find it to be a fun experience. And whether that's getting help, whether that's learning something new, whether that's being able to do something faster or better than you could do it before, whether that's automating a process that you used to have to do mainly that you didn't enjoy, our staff really enjoy the process of making technology easier, more seamless, more frictionless, and even fun for our clients. The next thing I'll show you just kind of on background is how Paragus is structured. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but there's really different services that we're providing to the organizations that partner with us. One is on-demand support. So that's, I just spilled coffee over my laptop. I need it fixed immediately. I can't get into my email. I got this weird message. I don't know if I should be worried about it or not. The things that happen on an intermittent kind of uh, immediate basis. 
Then we have an entire team dedicated to streaming compliance, and that's where we're going to drill deep today. We have an entire team dedicated to strategy. This is the team that helps organizations think about which technology are they using? What's the roadmap? What are the next three years look like? How can we use technology better, faster, smarter, more efficiently? And then that brings us to our fourth department that we call our business automation team. And their job is to actually work with our clients to leverage technology to save time. There's a lot of opportunities now to use automation, business intelligence, AI, machine learning, to automate processes that used to be very manual. In fact, there's a lot of law firms that are using AI to do discovery on um, initial kind of analysis, looking through hundreds of thousands of emails to find specific keywords or phrases, even noticing things like tone or whether somebody starts writing shorter, more formal emails instead of longer, more informal ones. So a lot of really cool things happening. And there's really kind of big stuff happening. But there's also really small stuff, like just the process of onboarding a new client, the process of onboarding a new associate in the firm. A lot of those things can be automated, which can save a lot of time and spend more time doing the work that actually matters. And then kind of the underlying department or the foundation of those four pillars is our products department. Anytime we do an IT product for customer, we actually bring in a full-time product manager to oversee that. But enough about us, let's get into the topic at hand. So really what we're here to talk about today is cybersecurity. And I can make that really, really poignant for you. We all have a hundred things that we could be doing right now. We're probably all busier now than we have ever been. Just seems like between the labor market and the speed and the economy and everything going on, there's a lot to manage and keep track of. So why are we all giving up time on our afternoon to talk about cybersecurity? Well, let me give you some stats. So this is specifically cybercrime within the law kind of the industry. This scary one that should just concern you is that 97% of law firms have been compromised. And we'll talk in a minute about what the definition of a compromise is and why that percentage is so high. But that means that most of you on this call have experienced some level of compromise, as have 97% of your peers. It's a very startling statistic. And there's some reasons that law firms are a big target. They tend to have a lot of sensitive and proprietary information. Some of that information can be very confidential. They tend to have a lot of banking information and are often involved in banking transactions that are often unique banking transactions. You know, if I'm buying an organization and doing an acquisition, I'm wiring money to an account that I've never wired money to before. And if you send me wiring instructions, I'm going to trust them because why wouldn't I trust them? Unlike a vendor that I have to pay every single month, then I'm going to be very suspicious if they suddenly change their wiring instructions. So you guys are definitely high on that target list. You also have a lot of M&A info. Some of that could be, you know, potentially used uh, um, to benefit. You know, I doubt anybody on this call is dealing on any organizations that are publicly traded, but that isn't a common target is to use information that might influence stock buys on the market. And then there's IP info and other information that they know is valuable. But the, honestly, another big piece of it is just they know that you guys take your reputations really seriously. And they know that the last thing that you're going to want is somebody to find out that there was some sort of breach of their security, of their data, of their information. So that they know that if they get into your network, you're very, very likely to pay a ransom, to do what they ask, to be a good victim, to put a bad term on it because they know that this information is typically very important to you. Another thing to know is that about 225 uh, days is the typical period that goes on between when the breach occurs, the compromise occurs, and when the law firm finds out about it. And it can be much longer. We have seen cases where it's 365 days, two years, three years later that you find out that there was a compromise that involved your organization. And I'll show you a little bit of that when we get later in the presentation. And then the unfortunate thing is that 84% of the time, you're not the one that figures out you were breached. Somebody else tells you. A customer, another vendor, or a third-party organization, like some of the ones I'm going to show you guys today, tend to be the ones that identify this information and make it available. 
Now, some of them are going to make that available just to you, but a lot of them are going to make it available much more publicly, which can be embarrassing and have ramifications, uh, which is why this topic is so important. Because just because you don't think you have ever had a compromise, 97% of you have, and you're not likely going to be the one that figures that out on your own. That's not common. Most of the time, it happens through some third party. Just pause real quick. Any questions on any of that so far? All right, keep going. So just a couple more stats and I promise you I'm not gonna depress you the whole time. Uh, but a couple more stats that are just worth understanding. And this is good for you guys to understand for your clients as well. You know, we're kind of looking at this from two perspectives. Some of you are business lawyers that consult with organizations and you want to have good information to share with them. And then obviously the other thing you want to do is keep track of your own practice and your own data. So these are some important stats to understand. And it really just is all about this one stat, which is that we're at a point where this is costing $6 trillion a year. And that ought to be unacceptable. <laughs> that ought to be completely unacceptable. Uh, unfortunately, the governments that are trying to figure these things out are still doing that. They're still trying to figure it out. And so you boil that down to $190,000 a second is being wasted. And wasted is the right word on cybersecurity. And this is everything from ransoms getting paid to businesses being damaged to recovery to remediation to all kinds of reputational impact. And then beyond that, there's credit monitoring and alerting and notification requirements and compliance standards, all of this that ought to not be a thing. It's all damage being caused by cybercrime. And the challenge is it's a very complicated problem to solve because typically speaking, these attacks are happening in countries where the U.S. has very little presence, very little jurisdiction, and very little influence. And so when we're targeted by countries like Russia, Ukraine, South Africa, we don't have a lot of recourse without taking military action. And thus far, our government has been relatively unwilling to take military action, for better or for worse. I would never be a, an advocate for that. But it is a challenge, and it's one that we're all struggling with. And it speaks to why this is so important, because this is not the kind of thing that we can count on the FBI, the CIA, the other three-letter agencies to help us with. In fact, we'll even talk about that. But when you have a breach, the FBI would like you to notify them, but not because they're going to open a case or do anything about it. They're just trying to understand the problem at a macro level. So they're always interested and want to learn about it. But there is no government agency that's going to step in and help you if you have a situation. You're going to file a local police report because you have to for insurance reasons. You're going to maybe notify Homeland Security, maybe Secret Service, probably the FBI. And again, you don't have to. You're not required by law to do so. But we typically do so on behalf of our clients, usually anonymously, because it is good for them to have that metadata in the hope that maybe someday they can put the bigger picture together and help solve this problem at a high level. But at an individual level, the individual organizations that are breached, they don't have any government agency that's going to help them recover those funds or track down the bad guys and bring justice. It just doesn't exist, uh, which is why the burden really falls on you as the business owner or as the business consultant to another business owner to take this seriously because you are really the best line of defense that you have and probably the last and the first line of defense that you have. So let's just kind of talk about what are some of these cyber attacks. You've got a huge surge in ransomware and this is becoming increasingly frustrating. Some of them make the news, right? So we heard about the oil and gas pipeline. We heard about the meat packing industry. We hear about the really big ones, and those make headlines every predictably two to six weeks, they'll be one in the news. But the reality is these are happening several times an hour. These attacks are constant, and they just don't make the news with any uh, kind of any repetition because most of them are not huge organizations that the entire world depends on. When it's a manufacturing company down the road in Greenfield that manufactures one piece that Smith & Wesson uses to manufacture a firearm, that's not gonna make the news. And honestly, it's not even gonna make the local news because a lot of times the business owners involved don't want the world to know that this happened. 
you know, you have to think about that in these cases where you do find out about it, somebody was willing to share and be open about it. I can tell you in the clients that we work with, most of them don't want to be open about it. They want to keep it as quiet as possible. We dealt with one where it was a two and a half million dollar ransom of a 700 person organization with offices in seven different countries. They didn't want their customers to find out it happened and they didn't have to, they, no, no confidential data was breached. So they had no compliance requirements to notify them and none of their contracts required them to notify them. And so they didn't want to notify them. They wanted to keep it quiet for the reputational benefit. And I get that it makes perfect sense but it just means that you're not going to hear about just how big a problem this is, but this is a really, really big problem. So the next thing uh, is malware. This is becoming a constant thing on any internet connected device. And we used to only have to worry about malware on our PCs. Now malware is everywhere. It's on our cell phones. It's on our smart fridge. It's on our Roomba vacuum. This malware has just become so uh, ubiquitous with all the technology that it's coming out everywhere. There is malware in electric cars. There is malware in electric bikes. There's malware everywhere that you have an internet connected device. And why that's scary is at best it's stealing data and at worst it's gonna be used in some sort of an attack. You can imagine what happens when a Tesla gets malware and a hacker is able to control that vehicle and they do something like hold the occupant hostage. It's a very scary scenario. And that increase in malware getting internet connected devices is becoming prevalent. Phishing is the topmost crime. This is the one that I guarantee you everybody in this call has had some exposure to. And most of you probably don't know it, but have been an actual, um, you've successfully fallen for a phishing attack. Most people don't realize that they have, but just about every internet user alive today has fallen victim to some phishing attack. I have, I run a 55 person IT company and I have been tricked by these things. Some of them are just amazing. They're really, really, really well done. We are so, so far beyond the Nigerian prince asking us to, you know, we've inherited a million dollars if we only wire him 10,000 to cover the cost. Like that's, these are much, much more sophisticated attacks and they're constant. They are just constant. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them every minute of every day are going out. And they're doing more and more research before sending them to target them. So they're not just random kind of run of the mill. They're really getting specific about trying to figure out what email platform you use and then using that in their phishing attack or what law product you're using or where you're located and using that information to influence the attacks. 67% increase in security breaches. We can talk about that. Stalkerware is going up. That's basically software that tracks where you are, what you're doing, and they either use that data to sell it to data companies or they use it to create a more sophisticated attack. And then social engineering is the most successful means to conduct a data breach. So that is how most of these organizations are having some sort of infiltration is through some form of social engineering. Uh, yeah, so somebody was asking about VPN encryption. VPN encryption can be very helpful. So what VPN encryption does, it masks a lot of what you're doing on the internet and encrypts the traffic so it's harder to sniff. And that is one good technology, but there is no one silver bullet in this fight. And we'll talk about it in this presentation. Most of this presentation, I promise you, will be focused on what those bullets are that you should have in your chamber, the things you should be doing to protect your organization. And certainly a good VPN can be a, a piece of that strategy, um, you know, an element of your armor, but there's a lot more that you're gonna have to take into consideration. And we'll go through what those best practices are. Uh, so to that point, just a little bit more Smaller doesn't mean safer. And this is another common misconception. I talk to CEOs all the time who tell me, oh, we're a five person law firm. Nobody cares about us. We're a one person dog walking agency. Nobody's going to care about us. No, they do. <laughs> they very much care about you. And they care about you for a lot of reasons. 
mainly because they know you don't have the IT budget that the large companies do. So large companies have teams of people who monitor cybersecurity. And they spend a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of time trying to keep hackers at bay. Small organizations don't. Oftentimes you've got business owners and CEOs who are wearing lots of hats, working in the business, on the business, do you know, chief cook and bottle washer. Those people tend to not have a lot of resources, time or energy to focus on cybersecurity. So they make great targets. You know, I use the analogy of if you're driving in a neighborhood and you've got a great cul-de-sac, lots of houses, and you're a criminal and you want to break into them, you're going to look for the one that the lawn's not mowed and there's no ADT sticker in the front and, you know, sign in the front yard. That's a good indication that somebody's either too busy, too cheap, and or doesn't take security seriously. And that's going to be the victim that you go after. And so that's more and more how these attacks are done. These attacks you have to understand are being conducted not by individuals, but by massive corporations, huge companies. And these companies, like any other massive company, have processes and funnels. And so they have tools that go out there and just crawl the internet looking for organizations. For example, they crawled the PPP list, which was public data, and they use that to find the size of businesses, the names of businesses, who the registered owners were. They've used a lot of publicly available data that they can mine off the internet to identify potential targets. That's the top of the funnel. Then they run another wave to say, okay, look at this list of potential targets and let's see who has what level of security. And a lot of that data you can see from externally. So if they run that scan and they say, okay, of these 100,000 businesses, these 20,000 don't have the ADT sign in the front lawn. That's who goes to the next level of funnel. And then they run a basic campaign and they see what the susceptibility is. And let's say 500 of those fell victim to that basic entry level campaign. Well, that's where they're gonna focus their energy. And so this is a data game. There's not individuals out there who are looking for your business. They're running these funnels, these processes, these systems, these bots, and they're just narrowing down the pool until they find an organization that meets the criteria and then they engage. Uh, so the other thing you have to keep in mind is that a lot of these organizations don't have basic protections. So they don't have the right systems in place for online banking. They don't have formal policies around using internet. They don't have policies around internet filtering. They don't have policies around social media. Uh, and why that's important, why I bring your attention to that is really this graph right here. 63% of cyber attacks can be prevented with simple and inexpensive cybersecurity measures. Another 31%, which gets us to 94, if my math is even close, 94% can be addressed between simple and cheap and what we would classify as intermediate. So you don't have to spend millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a good defense. A lot of what you need to do is in this category of simple and cheap or intermediate. And even if you just focus on the simple and cheap, like even if we just got those things out of the way, you're 63% more protected. And when these bots are out there crawling the internet, you're not going to look like as good a target anymore because they're gonna look at your business and say, ah, they're already doing some basic stuff. Let's move on to somebody who's doing nothing because I'd rather go to the house that doesn't have the ADT sign then go to the one that does and risk that it's being monitored and there's cops right on the corner and the owner's got a shotgun. Like, I, I don't want to mess with that stuff. I'm just looking for the low hanging fruit, the easy money. And so that's why these things really do matter and why it's important to take the time to understand these. Because if you just put yourself in the category of it's never going to happen to me, it's not a good state of mind. It will, and you'll be more damaged when it does. Or if you put yourself in the category of it doesn't matter, it's inevitable when it does happen, I'm just going to have to deal with it. That's also not a great state of mind because there's so much you can do to make yourself a lot less susceptible or to mitigate the risk or the damages that are worth doing. And so that's what we'll spend the rest of today talking about. Before I transition into that, any other questions for me so far? All right, we'll keep rolling. So these are the top four attacks that we're seeing right now. And the way I base this is we have a 
uh, a communication notification system in our company that goes off anytime one of our clients is having any kind of a cyber incident or event in their organization. So we support about 150 or so organizations across central and western Massachusetts. It's a good sample size. And our clients, as I mentioned earlier, we have kind of the five to 300. And then we have another category of client that we call co-managed, where they're from about 250 employees up to 1,000. So we've got a pretty good cross sampling of small businesses, medium businesses, lots of different industries. And so we really have a good kind of sense of what's happening in Western Mass. We're the largest IT provider in Western Mass, and now the largest privately held IT provider in Western and Central Mass. So we get a good amount of data coming to us. When I looked back at the last six months to see what are the most common attacks that are happening, these are the four that came up. There are others, but these are the four that you're most likely going to encounter for just looking at the odds. So the first is one that money, some of you may have had some exposure to, and it's where a hacker intercepts some sort of communication around a financial transaction. They interject themselves in some conversation about money being wired somewhere. And basically the, the game here is to trick the party into wiring the money to the wrong account. So I'll give you a really good example. We actually had two clients involved in the same incident. One was a construction company and one was a property development company. They were hiring, the property development company was hiring the construction company to do a bunch of work. They wanted a down payment on that work and the down payment was to be wired. The hacker saw the transaction about to occur. So saw the communication, the emails going back and forth saying, we're gonna be doing this work, here's the invoice, can you wire it? And what the hacker did was they took the invoice that the contractor was providing to the property development company. They took the invoice, stopped that email from going out to the property development company, edited the invoice. And the only thing they edited was they changed the bank account number where they wanted the money wired. The rest of the invoice they left in, you know, intact. So it still had the company's logo and the name and everything else was perfect. The only thing they changed was the bottom of the invoice where had the wiring instructions. They were even using the same bank. They were also using Bank of America. So all they had to do was change the account number, not even the routing number, nothing else. Then they sent the email through. Property development company had no reason not to wire the money to the Bank of America account. And so they did. And so that money was then lost because it went to the hacker, not to the correct company. And if you catch these things really quickly, like within 24 hours, Sometimes we can stop things and undo them and freeze bank accounts. But after about 24 to 48 hours, that money's gone. It's been wired several more times. It hops around. They have a pretty intricate system they use before they take it international. So it goes domestic, 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 usually three to four hops, and then it pops overseas. And once it's overseas, it's gone. Even domestic is hard, but once it's overseas, it's out. This is a very, very common attack. I'm sure some of you have had some exposure to this with your clients or heard about it. The next is ransomware. I think most of us are familiar with this. This is where a hacker gets into your network and the traditional attack is they encrypt all your data and they hold it hostage and you have to pay some ransom to get your data back. That's been going on for a long time now, but they're getting really sophisticated and very common. However, there's a new flavor of ransomware that is really frustrating. So ransomware, what happened was companies started getting better and better backups. And if you have a really good backup and the backup is designed correctly and the hacker can't get to the backup, which we can talk about later, if you have the right backup system in place, if you get ransomware, you just say, okay, no worries. I'll just restore from backup and we'll be okay. And that can be true if you have the right backups. And I say if, because most people don't have the right backups. But if you do have the right backups, you have a safety net. However, the hackers are constantly catching up. So what they realize is, okay, what we'll do is instead of encrypting the data and trying to give it, you know, give them the keys, we'll just take some really sensitive data and we'll threaten to post it on social media unless they pay the ransom. No backup in the world can undo that damage. And so they'll steal emails from the CEO's inbox and sent items. They'll look for client emails, look for financial data. They'll look for, and they have bots that are very good at looking for, data that they would deem to be confidential. 
data that would be embarrassing or um, that would break a non-disclosure confidentiality agreement, data that you do not want posted on social media. And they'll just extract that data, take it off site, send you a sample of it to prove they have it and say, this email is going on social media. We saw some of like the WikiLeaks kind of thing. This is kind of that flavor where it's a little bit more of, I'm gonna steal it in a threat. Now granted WikiLeaks, there was some theory of maybe this is for the common good, which we're not gonna to debate today, but this is not common good. This is purely extraction of money and they just wanna get paid off and they will do it. And they'll release an email a day until you eventually pay them off. Uh, or you can really afford to just let them do it, which can be very dangerous to a lot of organizations. So that's a pain in the butt. The third one is credential harvesting. This is where the point of the attack is just to steal usernames and passwords. And most of us have probably had this happen to us where maybe one of our clients or a vendor or somebody we do business with and know sends us an email that we weren't expecting. And it says something like, there's a confidential document I want you to take a look at, click on this link, or go to OneDrive, or log in here, or I want you to look at this. And a lot of times people fall for it because it's either coming from somebody in their own company or it's coming from somebody they know. And the email address is right. It's not like somebody pretending to be that person. It really is the right email address, the right signature. Everything checks out. And so we follow the instructions and we click the link or we type these in the password. And what those hackers are trying to do is they, it's like a spider web. They start with one person, they send out emails to all their contacts. Let's say 10% of those contacts fall for it and give them their username and password. Then they log into those people's mailboxes and they send the same email out to all their contacts. And we saw this happen about nine months ago where one of our clients did this. By the end of the day, we had over 250,000 known examples of that email just across the networks that we could see. That's an insane number. This email just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and grew exponentially. And not everybody fell for it, but anybody who did, their username and password was now compromised. And what the hackers are trying to do is they're trying to just collect as many usernames and passwords as they can in a very short amount of time, and then they sell them. So they go on the dark web and they sell these things for like five bucks each, especially if they're fresh. If they were harvested that day, they might sell for 10 bucks a pop. So you're selling these, let's say you get, you know, let's say you get a thousand of them at a hundred bucks a pop or even 10 bucks a pop or even five bucks a pop. It's not a bad day's work. And so that's kind of the goal there in those credential harvesting campaigns. And then what you have to worry about is then the guy who buys that for 10 bucks or five bucks, he's going to go then do something even worse that's going to extract a lot more money. This guy, the first guy is just trying to make a quick, easy dollar. The next guy is then going to buy that to execute a much more complicated, sophisticated attack. And then finally is the payroll theft. This has been growing in popularity. And if you haven't seen this one yet, what it looks like is you get an email from somebody saying something to the effect of, I need to change my direct deposit. So usually it's like the HR person, the office manager, and the email is going to come from one of their employees, or at least it's going to look like it's coming from one of their employees. And it's going to say, I need to update my direct deposit information. I got a new bank. We moved, whatever. The HR person is going to share what the process is. Oh, you fill out this form, or I just need a voided check. Whatever it is, they'll tell them what the process is. And the person will very quickly respond and provide all the necessary information. The HR person will have no reason to suspect any fraud, and they'll go ahead and update the banking information, the direct deposit to reflect the new banking. And then one or two payrolls goes by, and the employee suddenly goes, hey, how come I haven't been paid? And the HR person has this kind of panic look on their face, and we realize that what happened was somebody else asked to have the direct deposit changed, and the last two payrolls went to the wrong bank account. We would have this happen, and you'd think this wouldn't happen, but we had a, a nine-person ophthalmology group where the office manager changed the provider's direct deposit information. So, you know, obviously there's a lot more incentive to go after the highest compensated employee because that's where the most money is going to be, knowing this attack is only going to last a couple of payrolls. So they'll go after the highest paid, but they don't always, they go after anybody in the organization. And we have seen this attack work many times. 
because the HR just isn't trained to look for this. They don't know that this is a problem. So how is this happening? How are they able to do this so easily? Why are there just so many attacks going on? So what I thought I would do is just show you really quickly kind of an example of what this can look like. And I didn't want to pick on anybody on the call today, but if anybody wants me to pick on them, I'm happy to. But I picked out another law firm that I don't think any of you are associated with just as kind of an example for today's call. So let me show you what that looks like. There's a couple of things I'm going to do to go after this law firm. The first thing I'm going to do, and again, if this is me as a hacker, uh, is I'm going to do what's called a dark web search for this organization. And what a dark web search does is it crawls the internet, the dark web, kind of a secret internet, the dark seedy internet that none of us fortunately have any interactions with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it crawls that for any instance where that organization has been mentioned. And so when there has been a breach and somebody's trying to sell the information, they have to post it in a forum or a chat room in an, or an online auction. If there's been a known attack that was already thwarted or was successful, oftentimes once the hacker is done, they're going to throw that information up there on the dark web. So we can search for that information and we can become aware of it. I'll show you what that looks like. The other thing I'm going to do is just a real basic email search. Uh, and I'm going to show you just kind of as an example what that looks like. So this one I am expecting is going to look OK, but we'll see. So this is my unwitting law firm that I've decided I'm going to go after. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking up what are the public MX records. And MX records are mail records. They're what tells the internet how to deliver my email to me. And so it's kind of like your mailing address. When you route something to the post office, they have all kinds of codes and systems they use to break down your zip code and your city to get you to the right post office, to the right delivery guy, to the right mailbox, so that ultimately you get your mail. Well, email works very similarly. There's a lot of tools and technologies that operate behind the scenes. And these MX records are the key to that. They're what tell me if I'm emailing joe at ropesgray.com, where does that email get delivered to? And so these records are the post offices that will accept mail for ropesgray.com. And so what I can see here is that they're using a data center in Worcester, Massachusetts. I know that because I know who level three is. It's a company who owns a data center out there. And then they have a backup data center in another geography in case this data center is ever down. Now, why is that helpful to me as a hacker? Well, what it's telling me is that these guys are trying to manage their email on their own exchange servers. I know that because if the email is being hosted in the cloud through something like Microsoft 365, these are not the records I would see. I also know that the email is not being filtered by a professional mail company first. It's going directly to their exchange server. Now, they probably have an email filter device within that data center, but all this is really helpful information to me in deciding how I'm going to orchestrate my attack. The more information I have, the more successful my attack is going to be. And so this is public information. Anybody can search their MX records or anybody else's MX records and see where their post offices are for their mail. What I'm often looking for, like the sweet spot, this is good because this is an exchange server. Exchange servers are known for their vulnerabilities, their problems, their issues. When Microsoft created Microsoft 365, they kind of abandoned Microsoft Exchange, which was on-premise email, and said, you know what, we want you to go 365. We're not going to put a lot of time or energy into your on-prem mail anymore. So as a result, there's been a lot of vulnerabilities in the past five years that have made those situations very dangerous. So this is an environment where I might be able to engineer an attack on. But what I'm really looking for is people whose email is hosted by either Microsoft or Google, and they don't have an email filter in place. And when I see that, I find an automatic, easy, low-hanging fruit target that I'm going to go after. An exchange attack is hard. It's very successful, and it's very probable, but it's a lot of work. 
finding a customer who's using Gmail or 365 without filtering, that's low hanging fruit. That's stuff I can go after all day long. So again, I'm not doing this, a bot is doing this, but this is what they're looking for in the data they're trying to collect. They're also looking at these three things here. Does the company have a DMARC record? Is it published? They also do something called an SPF lookup. An SPF lookup tells me whether or not there's a technology that tells the world where their mail comes from that helps stop spoofing campaigns. So again, all of this is public information. And if anybody wants to kind of do some more analysis on their own email, we're happy to do that and kind of show you guys maybe during the Q&A section, what it would look like for your network. The next thing I'm gonna do though, and this is the more scary one. Not everybody can do this, but hackers certainly can. I'm gonna do that dark web search I was talking about. So we're gonna put in the domain name here. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna show me any time on the dark internet, on the dark web, where that domain name has appeared. It's gonna tell me how many times, what information. So right now it's doing a very extensive search through forums and chat rooms, all kinds of things. Now, the first thing that's gonna get me excited, there's over a thousand hits. That means I have a treasure trove of data to sort through. And the more hits, the more chances one of them is going to work. I only need one. So having a thousand plus to work with is a really exciting starting point if I'm a hacker. Well, what kind of information have I discovered? I've discovered usernames and passwords. So there's somebody named Kristen Mayer, and that's her password. I've blanked out most of it because I don't want to turn you into any hackers. But when they hackers are looking at this information, they see the full password, they don't see the asterisks. So they know a whole bunch of people's passwords. Now, not all these passwords are gonna work. You can see some of this is old data. These are actually pretty recent, but some of them are gonna be old and some of the older ones aren't gonna work anymore. But I've got a thousand plus to play with. I only need one in order to be successful. So like Pep, I guarantee you this is somebody's dog or cat's name, like Pepper2134, it's their home address or the, the year they were born. You see just how common people's passwords are when you do these things because they use their kids' names, their dog's names, their mom's names, their birthdays, their anniversaries. We're very predictable people. And the more that I see this data, the more that I've been exposed to it, the more I realize just how predictable people are and how common passwords are. So what they're gonna do if I'm a hacker is I'm gonna mine all this data, I'm gonna create a spreadsheet. And again, I'm not gonna use a bot that's gonna do this in a fraction of a second, but they're gonna take the username. We'll just pick on Larry Rowe for a second. And they're gonna take the password. Then what the bot is gonna do is it's gonna try that username and that password in hundreds of websites. Every bank, Facebook, you know, every social media platform, 365, Google, Every platform out there, it is going to try to log in simultaneously using this username and this password. Then what it's gonna do is it's going to add letters and numbers to the end. It's gonna change uppercase. It's gonna try all of the common variations because we all are told we have to change our passwords every now and then. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna do the things that we do when we change our passwords. We put an exclamation point, we do this, we do that. So it's going to try this username, this password, and very a whole bunch of uh, kind of iterations on that. And the bot is just going to report back if any of them worked. So in a fraction of a second, you know, maybe say five seconds, it can take these thousand plus users, these thousand plus passwords, try eight different versions of each one. So 8,000 logins across maybe 100 different websites. And so within a very short amount of time, 80,000 attempts have been made to log in using those usernames and passwords. And I only need one to work. So it's a very, very high probability that if I have this data set, I'm going to be able to get some entry point. And that entry point is where I'm going to begin. And then from there, I'm going to build, and I'm going to build, and I'm going to build, and I'm going to try to find some way to cause actual damage. So this information's out there, hackers have this. 
And there's no laws, rules, or restrictions about it right now. I mean, there are in the U.S., but not where these people live. And so this information is just, you know, public record, so to speak, if you're in the right environment and you have the right access. So with that said, what I want to do is talk about what you guys can do to prevent this from happening to you. As we talked about, you know, at the beginning of this presentation, a lot of things you can do that are not that expensive, that are not that complicated. Somebody in the chat mentioned they're using VPN encryption. That's not one of the things I listed, but that is a great piece of a strategy. But let me show you kind of what I would deem to be the biggest building blocks to building that strategy. The first is a term that I hope you guys are all familiar with. It's this concept of multi-factor authentication. We in the IT world constantly just refer to it as MFA. But what that means is that in order to log into something, I need more than just a username and a password. I need a second level of authentication beyond the password. It might be a text message that has a six digit code. Most of you have probably in, you know, seen that before where you go to log into your bank and they say, hey, we don't recognize this computer. We wanna send you a text message. You get the text message, you type it in and it lets you in. That's multi-factor authentication. We want to have that kind of authentication on anything that matters. At the very, very minimum on your email, if your email's with Google, if your email's with Microsoft, wherever your email is, at the very minimum, you wanna have multi-factor authentication on that email. You do not want a hacker to be able to log into your email simply by knowing your username and your password. If they have to enter in a code, they stop, they move on to the next guy. It's too much work to try to get that code from you. But it's not just your email. It's your law software. It's your remote access when you're working from home. It's any other access that you have to your network or to your data that allows you to access something sensitive. And that sensitive could be confidential or you know, sensitive information, but it might also just be sensitive access where because somebody has that access, they could cause damage to your business. So that's step one. It's not hard, it's not expensive, easiest thing in the world. This will get you the biggest, best bang for your buck is put MFA anywhere and everywhere you possibly can. If you just stopped here, you would protect yourself from probably 60% of what's out there. I really, really cannot overstate it. This is the best bang for your buck. And in most cases, it costs nothing. Maybe some time to set it up. The next is endpoint detection and response. So I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the concept of antivirus. Antivirus is useless. It doesn't do anything anymore. The types of attacks that you're gonna see are almost never a known virus being installed on your computer. Those days are a long since gone. What you need is a new form of antivirus that they often will call next-gen antivirus or they'll call it EDR. And what EDR stands for is endpoint detection response. What that means is that the antivirus isn't looking for a virus. It's looking for bad behavior. It's noticing that somebody's logging in from outside the country. It's noticing that somebody's trying to delete a whole bunch of data or encrypt a whole bunch of data or transfer a whole bunch of data to Dropbox. It's noticing that something is happening on this computer that is not normal. And it's going to take preventative action. It's gonna lock down the computer. It's gonna set off alarm bells. It's gonna do all kinds of things to make sure that that attack is thwarted, reversed, and that there's alarms and notifications that go off so the attack can't spread. If you just have normal antivirus on your computer, you know, the Windows Defender that came with it or Norton, God forbid, Symantec, McAfee, none of those are going to do it. You need an endpoint detection and response or EDR product installed on your computer. And in a perfect world, you want what's called an MDR, which stands for managed detection and response. And what that means is not only do you have the software on your computer, but that kind of like having a security company monitor your cameras in your building, there is a team of people who is monitoring those agents. And if those agents see something, they're going to alert real human beings in real time who are watching 24 seven. So there's an actual armed security guard who's gonna get a, you know, a notification saying, hey, right now somebody's on this computer doing something bad. 
And beyond the software stopping it, you're going to have a real human being being able to intervene. So at a minimum EDR, in a perfect world, managed EDR or MDR. The next is email security. It still blows my mind how many companies don't filter their email. If you don't filter your email, it means that I can send you whatever I want and I know it's gonna to get to your inbox. I can send you a virus, I can send you malware, I can send you trackerware and spyware. I can send you phishing attacks and spoofing attacks. I can send you an email pretending to be you. I can send your assistant an email pretending to be you. There's no rules. Anything can go in your mailbox. With email security, you're saying, wait a minute, before the email comes to me, before it gets delivered to my post box, I want it to go to this other company and I want them to screen it. So think of it like the President of the United States, he doesn't just get mail delivered to his desk. Think about all the steps that mail goes through, how many people open it and inspect it and test it for you know, any kind of poisons or toxins. You want some level of security on the email that's being delivered to your mailbox. So what this company does is they open up the attachments to make sure there's no viruses in the attachments. They look for any malicious code. They click the links and make sure the links all go where the link said they were gonna go and that the link doesn't go somewhere else as a trick. They make sure that before that email comes to you, it actually is legit, it's clean, it's safe to click on. They also make sure that nobody's pretending to be you. So I can't say my name is James Winston, it's actually gonna check and make sure that this actually is James Winston, not somebody pretending to be James Winston. So email security is vital. And again, not expensive, not complicated, but really critical. The next one is you need to provide training and testing for your employees. And I say testing specifically because we all do trainings, kind of in one year out the other sometimes, or maybe we pick up a nugget or two, but then we go back to work and we forget all about it. What's great about a testing program is it brings it to life. So typically the program that we enroll customers in is randomly throughout the month, every single one of their employees is going to get a cyber attack on them. They're not gonna know when or what or how to expect it. But what we're gonna do is test whether or not they fell for it. If they did, at the end of the month, we create a summary and it goes to whoever is in charge and it says, okay, we sent out these 30 attacks. These four people fell for it. Here's how bad they fell for it. And then what we do is we enroll the people who failed in a kind of remedial training program. And then it's rinse and repeat. Every single month, there's another one of these attacks at some random point throughout the month. And the testing component is really what keeps people at that kind of alert level. They're constantly looking for this. They're constantly vigilant. They're always worried that they're going to fail the test. And so they start to become a lot more scrupulous with every other email. And it really raises the security of the practice. And then, as I was showing you a second ago, it's really important that you are the first person that is notified when your credentials are leaked. So I showed you that scan where we looked at that poor law firm and all of the breaches that had occurred to them. That's a huge law firm. I think they have like 500 attorneys and God knows how many other employees. So it's a very, very large firm. But even small firms are going to be victims of these types of things. And what you want is you want to be notified the second that happens. So we can set up a monitoring system that will tell us the moment that your username and password appears on the dark web so that we can instantly go and change your password. So there's no ability for a hacker to use that in an attack against you. And then the last thing I would say is maintaining equipment. You know, I think sometimes when you hear that you can't use Windows 7 anymore or you need to do your Windows updates, not everybody understands just how serious those things are. It really is vital. When Windows stops supporting an operating system or Microsoft stops supporting an operating system, a lot of vulnerabilities are exposed and Microsoft does nothing about it. And so it kind of creates this chasm for really bad things to happen. That's why Exchange is so vulnerable right now. It's why Windows 7 or God forbid Windows XP, if it's still out there, you really do have to maintain your environment. You have to update your firewalls. You have to update your computers. You have to replace them on some sort of schedule. You have to make sure the things that you're using haven't become too antiquated because if they have, they're gonna be full of holes. And those holes are very well known, very well documented holes that hackers are gonna to use to perpetrate an attack against you. 
And it's very, very common that it's a multi-prong attack where maybe one person fell for a phishing email and that gave them the in. And then they used the in to find out there was a Windows 7 computer on the network. And they used that computer to get into the network. And then they have perpetrated the attack from there. So it is kind of, you have to be defensive on all fronts. You got to have good staff. You got to have good equipment. You got to have the right security in place, the right monitoring. And all that together, you know, I've only shown you five things. Those five things would cover their intermediate and the basic level. You would be 94% defended if you did the five things I've shown you. And somebody mentioned VPNs, that's a sixth. That might get you to 96%. These aren't big, complicated, scary, crazy things. These are relatively manageable things that you can do to really protect your organization or if you're advising another organization to help them protect their organization. So let me pause there. Any questions for me at all about anything we've covered so far? All right, well then I'll go here just to kind of quickly wrap up for you. So where do I go from here? Now my goal was not to overwhelm you or to scare you too much, but it, this is a serious topic and it is important that we are very clear about just A, how important it is and B, how easy it is to be very much protected against these things. So these are the typical recommendations that we have for an organization who wants to start to take this a little bit more seriously. The first is to do an assessment. An assessment is going to allow us to identify the vulnerabilities within your organization. We can look for the five things I just showed you. We can look for 15 more. We're going to look at 20 things and see, okay, how many boxes do you check? If I was a hacker and I was coming after you, where would the vulnerabilities be? What would be the things I would exploit to get into your network? It's not that complicated. It's not that expensive. It's not that invasive. You know, for a few say $1,700, $1,750, somewhere, I think that's what the price is, you can have a lot of data about how vulnerable your network is. From there, you don't have to fix everything all at once overnight, but we prioritize, we say, okay, of the 20 things we looked for, 18 of them were true. Let's say 12 of them were true, be a little bit tighter. Of those 12, let's prioritize. MFA is going to the top of that list, guarantee it, because that's the most, best protection, then probably the EDR, then a couple of things. We're going to prioritize that list. We don't have to do everything all at once overnight necessarily, but we're going to make a plan that says these are the things that we're going to implement over the next 12 months, 24 months, even 36 months. Then we implement, but we also maintain. So we put the things in place. We make sure they're maintained. We don't just go out and buy a new firewall. We have to make sure that firewall stays patched. We can't just install EDR. We have to make sure that EDR is managed and maintained and updated. And then we reassess. Typically, every 12 to 36 months at some frequency, we reassess. We just say, okay, there's new attacks. There's new things to look for. How are we doing now? This is a living, breathing thing. Hackers are always innovating and trying to get over the, you know, find the new attack. And so we can't just rest on our laurels. We got to repeat this with some frequency. It doesn't have to be every day or every month, but every 12 to 36 months is a good cadence, depending on the size of the organization. And the last thing I want to say is that we're here to help. This is genuinely one of our, you know, most important things we do for our clients is we help keep them safe and secure and also compliant because we haven't spent a lot of time on that today. But a lot of these things are instituted by different data privacy laws, different regulations, different certifications. So some of these things you're required to do. And even if you're not required to, they're going to make a big difference. So you should do that. But you don't have to do it on your own. There is teams out there. We're one of them who can help guide you through this process and walk you through it and make sure everything's taken care of. You know, we ask you to think of us like your Sherpa. We'll carry the heavy load. We'll look around the corner. We'll show you the path. All you have to do is come along for the journey and enjoy it. And we're going to really take care of all the hard parts. So that's really everything I've got for you guys. I know we're running up on time, but I want to kind of just open up the floor. If there are any, are any final questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer any. There's a couple of questions in the chat, Delcy. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> Dan, I have that feeling way too often. Uh, the good news is you don't have to resort to smoke, smoke signals and carrier pigeons. 
you really can do this. And I know I've made it sound complicated and scary, but there's a lot you can do that really help. Uh, strong boxes for passwords can be great. So, you know, I mentioned there's 20 things. I focused on five to kind of keep it a little bit more focused. If I was to give you 20, certainly on the other 15 would be some sort of password management tool, password sharing tool. Single sign-on is another thing that we're looking for. That's a newer technology that a lot of businesses are gravitating towards. You know, we mentioned VPNs a couple of times. That would definitely be on the, on the bigger list. Um, those five things are the most important. If you're doing those, you're in really good shape. But then from there, there are other things that you can do that are still relatively inexpensive and relatively easy. And I would put kind of password management and strong boxes in that category. Somebody asked, how do we do the assessments? Um, it depends on the assessment. So we have a whole menu of assessments that we sell. We have some that are physical where we come on site and we inspect the office and kind of the physical security and the practices and how things are done. They even go around and look to see are like all the passwords on sticky notes on monitors. They also look under the keyboard. Turns out that's where most of you put your password. So they know that and they look for it. They check under your mouse pad. They don't go through your drawers. That's too much. But they look in the common places. Um, we have another attack that we do that's a much more sophisticated one where we actually pose as, you know, if you're in Comcast territory, we'll pose as a Comcast rep or charter, whoever your ISP is. And we'll go up to your front desk and we'll say, we need to access the modem. There's a reset we have to do. And we'll see just how much access we can get into your building when we should have access, you know, when we shouldn't be allowed in at all. So there's different levels of assessments. And if anybody wants to follow me on that, I'm happy to share kind of the menu of different offerings that we have. There are some that we can do completely remotely. So if a client just wants us to do kind of a high level analysis remotely, we can do that. Um, those are obviously a little less expensive because they're less invasive and uh, less time consuming on our part. Um, but we have kind of a whole spectrum. Yeah, so the assessments could range anywhere from, I think it could be as little as $500 if all we're doing is a phishing attack, which is where we send that email to your employees and see who clicks on it. I think that's kind of the entry level. And then on the other end, I think it's about $2,500 is our most expensive assessment. There are companies that you can hire that'll do twenty dollars and $30,000 assessments. Some of them, it's a huge waste of money. They're just doing what we're doing. Don't ever pay those guys. But some of them are doing what are called penetration testing. We don't do penetration testing. Penetration testing is a whole other level. That's where you first do what we do, which is you find the vulnerability. But then you actually exploit the vulnerability and see how far down the rabbit hole you can go. So if you scan the firewall and realize the firewall has some ports that should be closed, we would stop there and tell you that. An actual penetration test is then going to have a hacker use those ports to try to get inside your network. And they're going to go as far as they can go. If they can ransom your data, if they can lock everything down, if they can change your password, if they can lock you out of your own account, if they can get into your bank, they're going to go as far as they can possibly go showing you just how far a hacker could have gotten. Now, obviously, they're not going to steal your money and they're going to undo whatever they do, but it's a much more invasive attack. Very few organizations actually the penetration test. Certain organizations that are very large or publicly traded may have requirements to do that on some sort of frequency. But for the most part, the types of assessments that we cater for are typically what a small to medium-sized business needs to give them the right information so they can become safer. So somebody asked, do private email servers automatically filter? The answer is typically no. Pretty much my recommendation is if you're not paying somebody to do it, it's not happening. And if you're getting something for free, like Gmail will filter out some spam and some nonsense, you know, as will Microsoft. But that's not email security. They're not opening your attachments. They're not running for link aggregation. They're not checking for spoofing attempts. If you're not paying somebody for it, it doesn't count. So the big companies are Proofpoint, Zix, Mindcast, uh, Sophos. If those are the kinds of companies that you would be, you'd hear about, you'd be paying that would be doing email filtering. There's a lot of other ones, but those are like the top five, the big guys that, you know, that have most of the market share. Um, the two that we use are Zix and Mimecast. Those are in the top three. I think Proofpoint's the other one that's up there. Um, so it'd be somebody you're paying for that you would be contracting independently uh, separate from your email service. So cyber insurance, you have to have it. 
It's, it's not negotiable. It's absolutely critical. Um, it's going to be as expensive as your risk is. So some of you won't be able to get it. If your network is a disaster, they won't even underwrite you anymore. And that's new. It used to be anybody with $1,500 could get a cyber policy. That's not true anymore. Now you're going to find that when you apply for cyber, any reputable company is going to have an attestation form you have to fill out. You're going to give that to your IT person. They're going to fill it out and they're going to tell you you don't pass it. And then they're not going to underwrite the coverage. If you pass, let's say 80%, you'll get coverage, but the premium will be really high. There'll be a lot of exclusions. It won't be a very good policy. In order to get a good cyber policy, which you should have, you have to be doing those hygienic things first. So you got to have those top five or 10 things done to get an affordable cyber policy. And then you want to have that because at that point, it's going to be affordable, but it's going to be that last line of defense where if somebody does get in, you don't want to be on your own, especially if it's client data, you know, data that has liability associated with it beyond just your own risk. Some people will even require it. We're now starting to require that our customers have cyber policies because if they don't have cyber policy, then they come sue us. And the problem is our e &O coverage just goes higher and higher and higher. So our e &O provider wants us to ensure that our customers have a cyber policy that will take place first before it rolls into our e &O policy. And that's just because these are, you know, $6 trillion. We're not talking about chunk change. We're talking about real money. And these insurance companies are upside down. They were all running $1,500 policies and paying out million-dollar ransoms. But you can't do that very long before you're underwater. So they've learned very quickly that they've got into this market a little bit blind and they're really reacting strongly. So we're constantly getting these forms and they're very, very hard to fill out. Um, so you should do it, but you got to get the hygienic stuff done right. Otherwise, it's not going to be affordable. Saving passwords is dangerous. We typically don't recommend it unless you're using a secure password saver. So for example, letting Chrome or Edge save your passwords for you, I would strongly, strongly, strongly advise you not to do. If a hacker gets on your computer, that is a plain text file that they can just export as a spreadsheet and take with them. If they even get into your Gmail account, they can do it remotely. You don't want to let Google, Microsoft, don't let those companies save your passwords for you. Turn off the feature so it doesn't even ask you. And when it does ask you, say no, 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 never. But secure password managers are great. LastPass is probably the most industry common one. Most of us are familiar with that company. There's a lot of other ones out there. But having an actual company whose job it is to be a password manager is phenomenal. And they work very similarly. When I go to a website, it fills in the password for me. But it's not storing it in Edge or Chrome. It's storing it in a very secure vault that's encrypted. So I use LastPass. You probably saw me log into that website using LastPass. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a best practice. It's a good thing. But don't use Internet Explorer or Edge to store those passwords. That's not a good thing. All right, I know I'm over time. I'm sure you guys have a lot of work you need to get back to. Any final questions before I let you go? All right, well, thank you guys so much. We are always available. I think Nikolai uh, emailed each of you the invite to this uh, 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 webinar. So you have his contact information. Feel free to engage with him if you have any follow-up questions, if you want to learn more about an assessment. If there's anything at all you need, do not hesitate to reach out. This is why we're here. We're happy to help organizations. So please don't be shy. And otherwise, thank you for your time and hopefully this is helpful. Thank you, Delcy. We really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Happy to do it again. And I'll send you a copy of the recording, Jen, so you can distribute to whoever you want. Thank you. That's great. All right. Bye, guys.